Good morning. Good morning. First of all, you know that this work is in the nature of a secret work. That makes it very difficult because it means that there is no credit for anyone in doing it. No aggrandizement, no possibility of reward. No one can take credit for it or for any footage of it because it can't be spoken of. This work began with a group of 25 in New York City, and that's why it's called the 25 group. But actually, there are about 250 members of it. But they are situated all around the clock. In other words, if you are awake here at 7 o'clock in the morning and praying, when it's 8 o'clock in the morning, there's a group in New York. And there's a group in uh, London at 9. And there's a group on the continent at 10. And there's a group down in South Africa at 11. And there's a group in India at 12. And there's a group in Australia at 1. And so forth. 24 hours around the clock, there is some two or more gathered together, not necessarily in one room, but gather together at least in one city, engaged in this work. The object of it is this. As you do healing work, <clears throat> you come to see very clearly, as I brought out last night, that sin and disease and death and life has nothing to do with any person. Every person who has sin, disease, death, or lack is just a victim. Not one is responsible for the ills that they're suffering. Everyone is a victim. They're a victim of that Adamic belief in two powers, good and evil. Because if we had only one power, we'd have nobody suffering from anything. We'd have nobody stealing anything. We'd have nobody killing anybody. If there's only one power, there's nothing left on earth to do except enjoy life. It is only when there is an evil power that we begin to try to overcome it or we begin to use it for our personal end. But if there is no personal, if there is no evil power, then there's none to use, nor is there a need to be a victim of. So when you do healing work, if you are at all observing if you have freed yourself at all from emotion or emotionalism so that you can observe objectively what's going on, you will soon see that your adult patients are no more responsible for their diseases than your little tiny children patients. You certainly wouldn't want to blame them for their own. And so it is that eventually you get to see the impersonal nature of evil, of that which causes the different forms of error. Sooner or later, you commence to understand what is written on page 13 of the book, The Letter. A 
Although it uses the term Christian science, you can apply this to any phase of life you want. The time has now come, it says, to take inventory of ourselves to see how far we have come out of orthodoxy. In orthodox religion, you have two powers. All the powers of good are ascribed to God. All the powers of evil are ascribed to devil or Satan. Now you've come into metaphysics. But have you not transferred those powers of good from God to divine mind and the powers of devil or Satan to mortal mind? And do you not still have, do you not have still a power that this power of God or divine mind is going to overcome or destroy or help you rise above? In other words, have we not substituted the term mortal mind for devil or evil or Satan or error? In most cases, you will find that that's what you have done. That's what you will find that all metaphysicians, nearly all metaphysicians of all schools, are doing. They're using the power of divine mind over error, the divine mind to overcome mortal mind, the power of divine mind of love to overcome hate, they put it that way. Of course, all this is nonsense. Because the basic and original revelation of metaphysics was that mortal mind isn't a power. It's the sum total of all error, but it's nothingness. In the Christian science movement, that teaching was lost right while Mrs. Eddy was with us because she herself became a victim of fear. She became a victim of mortal mind. And even on her deathbed, sent a message to the Mother Church that her enemies had killed her, not disease. What difference does it make whether it's disease or your enemies, as long as you're going to be killed? As long as you're acknowledging error, you might as well call it the dear old devil of the bygone days. And it is for that reason that the Christian science movement is not doing as good a healing as it should be doing. There's no other reason. A lot of people blame the board of directors. I worked with them for 10 years, lived right across the street from them, and I can tell you they're all fine people. They're all very fine people and very sincere and doing the highest that they know and certainly the highest that can be done with a great big organization to control. They're not to blame. The Sentinel and journalists sometimes blame because the articles are no good, and certainly they are no good. The world would be far better off with 90% of them eliminated. But that doesn't make them to blame because science and health still exist, and prose work still exists, and if any individual wanted to dig out the truth, they could. So why blame the board of directors? Because we are too lazy to study and find out what the principles are. I also found this, that the board of directors never limited or restricted our activities, except in one way. As long as we were in the journal, we were not permitted to recommend openly the use of unauthorized literature. They did not restrict us from reading it. The directors knew we were using the first edition as our main textbook. The directors knew we were reading other literature. As a matter of fact, at one time, one director sent me down to New York to have a conversation with Father Devine. They knew what we were doing. They weren't blind. They knew that any practitioner who was doing good work had found out some things. They didn't object to that. They only objected to our confusing our patients. 
by introducing them into things that would bring confusion to them. They were getting enough confusion anyway, without our adding to it. No, the reason that Christian science is not doing the, I mean, Christian science work is not doing the work they have is because they have again accepted two powers. They have got a divine mind and a mortal mind, and the minute they stop that, they'll do better healing work. The minute they stop giving treatments, and just realize you can't fight error, you don't need any God power to overcome that which has no existence, except as a mental image in your own thought or in universal thought. They'll do good healing works, and I look for them to do good healing works through the use that they're making of the infinite way books and the increased use that they're going to make of them. But now we find that when unity was started, they took everything that Christian science had except one thing, and that one thing was the nature of error. They just didn't have to know anything about error because God was so all that there wasn't any error. It's a lot of nonsense. And they have lived to find that out, that they've had to reorganize and make themselves a religious organization with robes on the platform and hymns and candles and all the rest of those things that belong to orthodoxy because you have to have a substitute. If you don't heal, you have to have a substitute if you want to stay in business. We're faced with the same thing. We either have to heal or we have to go out of business or we have to have some way to fool the public. That's all. But we're, if we don't heal, we're going out of business. We're not going to engage in anything to go back to orthodoxy again. Now, if you once experience this in your healing work, that the sin, the false appetite, the disease, the unemployment, the lack, had nothing to do with the person involved, it had to do with the universal belief of good and evil, and uh, one with God as a majority, one with truth as a majority, Therefore, the truth entertained in my consciousness becomes a law unto your body or your business or your art or your profession or your health or whatever it is. One with God is a majority. The truth entertained in the consciousness of Jesus Christ healed his patients. The truth entertained in your individual consciousness healed your patients. There's no use believing a God did it. You all have heard that story about the practitioner out in Detroit who had uh, brought a woman out of cancer. The husband came in one day to express his gratitude and give the practitioner a check. The practice says, oh, I didn't do it, God did it. Oh, he says, well, I'll take the, God, the check back home with me. <laughs> See how I can get it to God. I thought you had done it. You see, that, that is all what we call cliches, and that's all a lot of absolute garbage. It is the consciousness of an individual that does the work. It is the consciousness of an individual, a consciousness imbued with truth a consciousness that has discovered the secret of healing. And the secret of healing is the one power. The secret of healing is the ability to take any claim that's thrown against, against you, ment mental, moral, physical, or financial, and bunch them all together as mortal mind or carnal mind and then dismiss them. Yes? There's another way of doing it. One of our students brought this to light the other day. A Christian science practitioner was working on a case and evidently rehearsing the statement when the illusion of sin or sickness tempts you, 
so forth and so on. Evidently he wasn't making too much progress on the case, even with the temptation of sin or sickness. But this student, infinite way student, immediately recognized that's only half the distance. When the illusion of humanhood tempts you, whether it's good humanhood or bad humanhood, that's when you have to begin to understand this is not a function of turning sick people into well people. This is not a function of turning sinful people into good humans. This is not a function of turning unemployed people into employed people. This is a function of realizing Christhood, individual Christhood, your Christhood. When you have a patient, it's no good merely to resist the temptation to believe in sin, sickness, and other discord. You have to also disbelieve in good humanhood until you understand the true identity of individual being as the Son of God. Now, your experience in healing work, nothing else, will prove to you the rightness of this. My saying it to you or my teaching it to you is no proof to you. It's merely the setting forth of a teaching. I can't even prove it to you. If I raised someone from the dead, you wouldn't believe it. You have to experience whether or not there is any need to battle error, whether there is any need to fight it, or whether there's anything to fight it with. You yourself will have to discover for yourself whether error is something that you defend yourself against or something whether you defend yourself against with the recognition, recognition of its nature. If you accept carnal mind as, more, as Paul did, You'll be in prison every week or get beaten every week, get lashed every week, get driven from city to city and post to post. If you understand the carnal mind, as Mrs. Eddy originally understood it, a term denoting nothingness, you'll be free. And you'll free others in that proportion. Now, with this in mind then, and I'll assume for a minute that you're going to prove this conclusively for yourself, then the next step is the recognition that the entire world is suffering not from its sins, not from the sins of its leaders, whether it's the board of directors or whether it's Stalin or his successor or whether it's any of the other dictators who have come on the scene or any of the ideologies that have gummed up mankind that's not what we're suffering from. We're suffering from the carnal mind uh, having been accepted as a power. That's all. When we nullify that, it is just like this. If we cut off the electricity, the bulbs are dead. If we cut off carnal mind, there are no instruments for carnal mind. They can't operate. They're dead. So we don't go around murdering dictators that we don't like or fighting ideologies that we don't like because as fast as you cut their head off another one will spring up, in fact two will spring up in the fight. But we go behind it and cut off the electricity and then watch what happens to these ideologies and the people who co-found them. And, uh, that's the only way harmony can be restored. Now that is the purpose that was behind the formation of the very first group of 25, and that was the purpose that carried it around the world. Every single day, we are supposed to have, at the very least, one period, whenever possible, two or three, in which we forget ourselves and our patients and our own demonstrations or theirs. 
and just see if we can't look at the entire world. In, in doing that, we come up against specific forms of error. It may be a storm that's going to hit your city, or it may be an infection or contagion that's about to strike, or it has already struck. Or it may be some uh, false form of government that is forming. It may be some other form of error. And you yourself, not fighting it, go behind it to the realization that this is that carnal mind, that mortal mind or nothingness. And you wipe that out. It makes no difference whether you use terms of Christian science or terms of infinite way or terms of any other teaching or literature or scripture as long as you get the meaning from it as you know I have openly acknowledged always the debt that I owe to Christian science and this is Eddie and I hope that those of you who have a similar debt will never forget it. And I'm sure Mr. Eddie would be the last one to object to our using the term mortal mind uh, as nothingness. And uh, so it is that whatever terminology we use, catch the meaning of this nothingness of era. And don't think of it as just the nothingness of cancer or the nothingness of uh, dictatorship or the nothingness. Go back of it to the nothingness of the carnal mind that appears as. Now always remember that just as you are going to discover in the case of your students and patients that actually it's God appearing as thee. So you're going to find that the carnal mind doesn't cause anything. The carnal mind appears as. It is the carnal mind that appears as false ideologies. It is the carnal mind that appears as dictators. It is the carnal mind that appears as infection and contagion. Carnal mind doesn't cause them. Carnal mind is them. And carnal mind is nothing. And when you've nothingized the substance, you've nothingized the form as which, always remember that the biggest word in the entire infinite way vocabulary is the two-letter word as. God appears as, not in, God appears as individual being. And uh, the carnal mind, evil, appears as the various forms that it assumes. So when you've uh, annihilated the substance, You've annihilated the form. Well, about uh, a year and a half ago, or may have been a few months more, in England I learned about the sublimal perception discovery. That was a year before it was experimented with in the United States, and it was one of the very first things that I brought to the attention of those groups uh, with the experiment rest hope that they would take that up in their work around the clock. And from the moment that it was brought out in the press in the States, we have had groups here in the States working on that very thing. Well, as you know, the first experiments were very successful. And then we learned of an experiment that was to take place in New Jersey and our little busy bodies got busy, and uh, the experiment was a failure. Well, yesterday I had the opportunity of speaking with one whose business it is to check every one of those tests, and I learned that the last three tests were also failures. But whereas there's been a great fear expressed in high places about the harm that that would do in the world, but today they're commencing to believe that it's going to be a failure and that it isn't going to do any harm. Now, that is no reason for us to rejoice at this moment, 
because the people are behind it are some of the wealthiest in this nation and some of the biggest legal authorities that there is in the entire United States. And so they are not going to give up just with a few failures. There's too much to be gained. If they win, they control the entire world. They're not interested in selling merchandise. That's only their outer pretext. What they're interested in is what you do when you go to the election ballot and which church you go to. Once they got you right in those two directions, they really won't care whether you buy from Macy or Gimbal or whether you buy silk or rayon. So that our function is not to battle them because in that we lose our own lives by making a reality of that which can only be real while it's accepted as real. And I want to caution you too if at any time you feel tempted to uh, try to slay Goliath, be very sure that you don't use anything bigger than a pebble because you'll find yourself slain. In other words, if you go at evil as if it were an evil, if you go out really to slay, you will be slain. Your only hope of meeting discord, that is why malpractitioners always end up malpracticed. Your only recourse is not battle. The battle is not yours. This is God's universe. The battle belongs to truth, and the truth is... Uh, that I am truth, and I am all the power there is, and I need not fear what the carnal mind can do. Watch out that when uh, David goes after Goliath, that he has no armament on him, and he has nothing bigger than a pebble. And be sure that that is the way you undertake your practice. Don't gird yourself around with all the statements of truth as if you were going to keep error outside. Don't gird yourself around with a lot of armament, even if you call it spiritual armament. The only spiritual armament isn't any bigger than a pebble. It's just your, as a matter of fact, always remember. You remember the power that is ultimately to destroy the four temporal kingdoms? stone carved out of the side of a mountain without hands. That's the weapon you're to use. A stone that you can't hold in your hands. When you understand that, you'll have the secret of the infinite way. For that is our secret. That is the one big thing that we have in this work. That this is our defense and our offense, empty hands, no weapon, resist not evil. Only in proportion as that is understood do our practitioners heal. The minute they go on a rampage against error, I know they're lost. You will have opportunity as you take up this work every day to find that a storm is headed for your dwelling place of one nature or another. And this is the time to get in this work. An epidemic, threatened war, an election, whatever it may be. But always remember, too, that your part is strictly anonymous. 
first place, if you try to make it known, you bring ridicule on yourself because nobody is ever going to believe that you can do such things. If anyone did, they'd begin to fear you. And be assured then that if they were big people and thought that you had such powers, they'd find a way to lock you up. So remember, this is, a, is an anonymous work. It is a secret work. And it is legitimate because we are not attempting to gain profit for ourselves, fame for ourselves, fortune for ourselves, or anything else. Our entire mission is just one thing, the demonstration of our principle of one power. That's all we stand to gain out of it, but that's enough to save a whole world. And uh, we surely don't need any credit for that because it isn't a personal thing. It's a principle that's been discovered. And always remember this, that we can't even take credit for discovering it because it's part of the principle that Buddha discovered when he sat under the Bodhi tree, that all of the good and evil of this world is of this world is just an illusion. That was his great discovery. It was the same discovery that the Master made when he was able to stand before Pilate and say, Thou couldst have no power over me unless it came from God. Same power he used when he went up to the leper and touched him. Leprosy, you can't do a thing to me. You're nothingness. Same power he said to the but man, what did hinder you? That was the same principle he was using. There aren't two powers, a power of God and a power of paralysis. So what is hindering you? Get up and walk. It's the same power that he used when he applied spittle to the blind man's eyes. Spittle in the old Hebrew uh, way of life was a form of disgust, a form of, of disrespect. When a person wanted to indicate disgust or disrespect, they just spat. And so it was that when he used spittle on a blind man's eye, he was really saying, look, this is all that blindness amounts to, even spittle can cure it. In other words, no power is necessary to cure blindness because blindness isn't a power. Only God is a power. So... And, of course, it was the principle upon which Mrs. Eddy worked in the very beginning of her days that all of these things are illusions. She even said that we must overcome the insanity of good health someday. And that's just what we are working at in the infinite way, overcoming the insanity of good health. We are not merely knowing the illusion of sin or sickness. We are knowing the illusion of humanhood good humanhood and bad humanhood. So nothing of this is original with us. We can't claim any credit, any glory. It's an age-old principle, been discovered, rediscovered, lost. And if we have success with it, it's been because we rediscovered it and began practicing it, that's all. But if the day should come when some of our students should practicing students should do what some of our other students do, we'll be lost too. You've probably had the experience of having somebody write you or call up on the phone and say, help me get rid of my illusion. Well, if you know it's an illusion, it's already got rid of. That's the end of it. You don't get rid of illusions. That's making a reality of it again. So, <clears throat> that's our work in this work. If it's a hurricane coming at you, if it's a war, if it's infection, if it's contagion, if it's epidemic, get busy. Get busy. And nullify it in the same way that you would if it were an individual telephoning to you, I'm unemployed or I'm sick or I'm tempted with this, that, or the other thing. The main thing to watch in this approach is this.
The real success can only come when you are completely purged of judgment or criticism in connection with either the persons or the conditions that are coming to you to be met. You can't be really and truly a successful healer while prejudices or criticisms or condemnations exist. Let me illustrate this. This happens over and over and over again in our work. A wife comes to us and tells us all her troubles and her grievances and all the shortcomings of her husband. And she's a very sweet lady and very charming and, you know, for a minute you're tempted to believe her. Someday you meet the husband and you find out where the shoe fits. Or vice versa. And then you say, oh, what a fool I was to have believed that story. But you see, believing it is only one side of the picture. You can't disbelieve it either. You have no right to accept it. That's where the whole point comes in that I'm making. It isn't that she's wrong and her husband's right. Oh, no, that would only be with a shoe on the other foot. That would just be another aspect of humanhood. The point is that regardless if both are right and both are wrong or neither one is right or neither one is wrong, the point of it is that the whole thing is an illusion. The whole thing is the carnal mind or nothingness. And so you can't be on one side or the other. You can't accept one story or the other for the simple reason that neither story, neither story is true in the spiritual picture. Now, that's a very difficult thing to see. And it becomes even more difficult when a mother telephones you that her child is dying. Because immediately you're feeling for the mother and you want to save her child. And in that moment you've probably lost it. Right? You can't believe mothers when they're talking about their children. You can't believe anybody when they're talking about their problem. And that is the attitude that you have to develop that I call overcoming your emotions and going into this work objectively. Now, you can't have emotions in this work. You just can't. The only emotion, I think, that Jesus displayed was when he was throwing the money chambers out of the temple, and that's a legitimate emotion. When you see people wearing a spiritual robe or a churchly robe or a Christly robe or pretending that and then acting contrary to those principles uh, I think you have pretty good reason to get uh, up on your hind legs and start battling them throwing them out of the temple not necessarily actually but at least you're entitled to a little emotion because there is a different form of error. That isn't ignorant error, that's conscious, willful, knowing error. You won't heal it that way, you'll still have to get down one of these days and, and uh, view it in the right light. But at least if some emotion does come in, it is legitimate. Uh, when you see people with a church and uh, claiming it in the name of Christ and all this and that, and then uh, acting to keep people in ignorance, keep them in illiteracy even, so forth and so on. You can't help once in a while just getting a little bit hot under the collar. But it doesn't do any good, and eventually you have to even overcome that emotionalism. As you know, Jesus found that when he threw the money changes out of the temple, they only stayed out one hour. 
the next hour they were right back at their old stands again. And so he probably regretted that he had given in to his uh, feelings. On the whole, remember this. You're not really dealing with people, and you're not really dealing with conditions. Therefore, you don't have to have any emotion about them. What you are dealing with is an impersonal thing called a carnal mind or a mortal mind presenting itself as pictures. That's all you're dealing with. You don't have to be sympathetic about the child that seems to be sick or dying, or the alcoholic. You don't have to be sympathetic with... Uh, what seems to be going on in the human picture when you yourself have seen that the fabric of that picture is the dream. The fabric of these human pictures of the Adam dream or, or the hypnotic dream. And uh, once you've seen that, you can't emotionalize about any of the pictures that it presents. I could get emotional sometimes. There is one thing that stirs me, and that is seeing these young kids sent out to war. I can't take it. Very difficult. It's the one thing that I find myself having to uh, control my emotions on, because that isn't merely the sin of governments. That's the sins of the mothers who permit it. They don't have to permit it. No. They have PTA associations. They could just as well have other associations say, you can't have my son. If you want any killing, let the enemy come and kill me. But why my son at 18, 19, 20, 21? Let him come over and have me. And you. Right up there in the legislature. I don't mind if they get you. I don't mind if they get me. But you're not going to have my son. Not voluntarily. It could be stopped. We're all responsible for it. We've all gone out ourselves and we've sent others out. That's one thing I still emote about a little bit. But it's very foolish on my part because there again, it isn't the government that does it. It isn't you that do it. It's that same old carnal mind again that when it's dead, it won't have any you or me to work through. So in the end, we all have to give up our humanness. Every one of us has to give up all of our humanness, our human sympathies, our human pity, our human emotion, and begin to understand that we are being presented with pictures presenting the carnal mind presenting itself as form. If it doesn't fool us with one form, it fools us with another form. And we have to awaken ourselves to see. That is the function of this group. That is the function of all groups like this. To use that little pebble against the great big Goliath. But be sure that the pebble's so small that when I open my hand, you can't see it. It's a stone carved out of the side of a mountain without hands. It's a nothingness, and it's a knowledge of nothingness. And that's what meets your cases, and that's what meets the larger work. When you have capital related capital and labor relations cases would be the same way. You don't think of people. You don't think who's right and who's wrong. It's a very dangerous thing to sympathize or to have any emotion for either side. And you won't have success either. You have to enter it with the idea that I'm not dealing with persons or situations or conditions. I'm dealing with, again, the fabric of nothingness. The fabric of the atom dream appearing as pictures and then watch it fade. Now are there any questions you'd like to ask me about this?
It is. It is. That's what I said. That in the end we have to get over our emotion about that too. But that doesn't uh, really change the fact that it's an undesirable situation. But uh, that's right. But they will all have to be handled from the standpoint of uh, the fact that they are pictures of carnal mind having the, only the substance of the dream, which is nothingness. Right on. When you undertake this work as a daily work, don't misunderstand me. You're not to be groping around in your mind for some evils to overcome. When you do this work daily, the first purpose is to sit in meditation for the realization of God, for the realization of the Spirit, of the present. If you experience that presence, the discords fade of their own nothingness. It is only when something intrudes itself upon your consciousness, or as in the case of the subliminal perception, that you do, not every day, but occasionally, bring it back to your conscious remembrance and look behind it to see what functions it and then nullify it. Don't act as if this committee work were just going out to do battle against evil every day. That isn't its function. Its function is to realize God, and then whenever any picture of the mortal scene presents itself, to handle it, and always handling it as the fabric of the dream or nothingness, the arm of flesh. And then just bear witness to the fact that it's destroying itself. We're not a crusading committee, in other words. No, wait a minute, no. I said that healing work, your treatment, if you want to call it treatment, takes place at the point of contact. Whether the healing is going to take place or not, uh, at that moment we have no way of knowing. The healing may take place only after the tenth contact, or it may take place uh, a year later. We don't know when the healing is going to take place. We know when the work is going to be done. When the patient contacts you. When the patient contacts you, at that moment is when the work is done. If this telephone bell rings, and I pick it up and somebody asks for help, that's when my work is done, even if I continue talking here. I don't think of them, but if they come to my thought, that again is when they come. If I am confident that what has been presented to me is just the carnal mind presenting another picture, and that's what happens when I get the call, and as far as I'm concerned, the whole thing's dead and done. But if an hour from now that case intrudes itself into my mind, if I think of the person again or the condition, 
or three hours or eight hours or every three hours or every eight hours, I have to relieve myself in one way or another. In other words, I have to find my peace. Now, sometimes it intrudes so forcibly that I am compelled to go off in a corner somewhere and sit down until I actually attain the realization of God's presence, until I'm completely enfolded in the Spirit and probably receive some assurance from within that all is well. But uh, that doesn't always take place. Sometimes I am forced to sit down, and in a minute or two, or five, I get my peace. But there are times when I will have to be a long time and go back at it several times before I ultimately attain that peace, which is a release. That doesn't guarantee that they're healed either. It merely guarantees that as far as I'm concerned, I'm healed, my work is done, but there comes their ability to respond. Jesus said, do you believe that I can do this thing? Well, of course, if you don't, uh, that's that. Uh, are you really opening yourself to this or have you got a little bottle of medicine around the side? Okay. Are you really opening yourself to this, or does the patient feel, well, of course, if it doesn't work, I can go to the hospital, it doesn't cost anything anyhow, we have social security, you know? And uh, so, you have to have, to begin with, a, a single-pointed mind when you enter this work, don't you? The practitioner as well as the patient. Yeah. The practitioner can't have fear because the practitioner isn't dealing with a person or a condition. So they know to begin with that they're dealing with a nothingness. But is the patient always ready to give up? No. Sometimes the patient is a divided household. We have cases like that, especially now with calls coming through the Orthodox Church where they've asked about 24 people to pray, and we're just the 25th. And then, of course, if we say yes, well, that just means that 25 people prayed and they got well. There's still no opening themselves to a principle, no opening themselves to a way of life. It's just a sick person has been made well. That's all there's to it which is not really our ministry is. So that, even though we do all we can, the point is that the patient isn't always healed. Very often, look how many of our calls come from wives who want their husbands treated or mothers who want their children treated and so forth and so on. And the others don't even know they're being treated and wouldn't want it if they did know it. Wouldn't be interested. You have no assurance at all that uh, that is the way the healing is to take place. You only know that as far as you're concerned, you're healed, you're relieved, you're free. And uh, if your patient or student is really on this path, even though they're not healed with that, they'll keep after you and keep after you and keep after you until freedom is realized by them. As far as you're concerned, they could have had that freedom six years ago. Yeah. But always there are these interfering uh, things. No practitioner in this work should alibi themselves for failure to heal. But then there are reasons why all healings do not take place. Look at us, with all the effort we put in, with all the devotion, with all the life we lead, and every one of us come up against a claim here and there, and some of them that don't yield. So it just shows you that it isn't always a guarantee that everything's going to disappear. The reason is this.
it appears to us that we're being healed in one part of our body and then in another part and in another part. But that's really not the goal of our life and that isn't what's happening. What is happening is that we are being freed of our materialistic consciousness. And as we are freed, some part of the body gets a release. As we get a little more freedom, something else breaks. Or the finances break, or something else breaks. And so it is that as we go on, veil after veil of the illusion drops away. And as this one drops away, it frees us of uh, a moral fault, and this one drops away, and it relieves us of a physical discord. And this one drops away, it relieves us of a financial or economic limitation. So it is. We won't see the uh, fullness of the Christ head bodily until the ascension. the medicine is also part of that whole carnal picture that has no power. You're not asking them to give it up. But that doesn't say that until they do receive some realization that makes them give it up, that they may not experience the healing. They may. You see, many cases come to us of people who are not on the path, that just because of their extreme condition are turning to this. They may have heart disease and not be able to give up their digitalis. They may have uh, diabetes and not be able to give up their whatever that is that they use. Uh, they may have a broken leg and can't give up their crutch. They have wear eyeglasses and they can't give them up for one reason or another. That is not a hindrance to our work. But eventually it has to dawn on them and then they can't keep using this work as if it were an adjunct to God, to, to medicine. That is where our complaint comes in of the people in metaphysics who keep on using medicine continuously while turning to this as an aid. Now that's encouraged in some of the metaphysical movements. You keep right on, we don't, we don't want you to give up your doctor, but we'll pray with you. Well, that isn't our particular function, do you see that? Neither do we tell them in their extreme to stop, but uh, after they're well, or after they're on the way, they can't keep coming to me and dividing my time and attention and the doctors too. That's, uh, sooner or later they have to make a choice whom they're going to serve. But certainly I don't ask it of them in their extreme. Well, you know, isn't it the belief of humanhood that really has to be healed and then these other things fall away, including that? There's no question about it. That if, if and in the degree that humanhood is healed, that all of that falls away. Relief of humanhood. That's right. That's all there is to it. But there are those, you see, who gain what is uh, apparent as a healing, you see, and yet never change their mode of life. They still go through life hoping that they can find somebody that will pray with them while they still rely on their materials. Like others, I've had this, I call them chronic borrowers. They're always asking for metaphysical help, but they're always living on borrowed money. You see, they never get to the point where they're willing to say, I'm willing to starve to death if 
God doesn't come to my rescue. I'm willing to take my stand and be put out of the house if I don't meet my rent. When you have those, you have the serious ones that make their demonstration. But there are the others who say, but I have to meet the rent, so I have to borrow. Well, my food bill is due. I must eat. And uh, so forth and so on. And it's very difficult to destroy humanhood there because even while they're praying to you, they're holding on to it so tight. Oh, on the other hand, there are people in those extremes because they really can't help it and who are seeking out of it, and you can relieve them and free them. All right, well, we'll... If there are any more questions, let us have them on the table at night. Work for that. When are we going to have this again? Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, this is a good class we're having here this week. And uh, it's good in two ways. It could in three ways. The most important one is that there's very high consciousness. So that anything that comes out from that high consciousness <coughs> is with power. Otherwise, words may come out with no power. But in high consciousness, it comes out with power. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> because the class has developed into the subject of mysticism. It really takes some of the mystery out of that word and out of the subject. And it makes it clear to us that actually <clears throat> living the spiritual life means living the mystical life. Living the mystical life really means living the spiritual life. And what do these mean? What does this mean? <clears throat> it means actually that we have come to a place in our consciousness where we have seen clearly the entire issue uh, of life. In other words, is there a material, physical, mental power or powers or is really spirit the only power? Now here is, if you want to call it that, the whole battleground. <clears throat> is material force power? Is mental force power? And it's on that point that you leave humanhood to enter your Christ identity. As long as you use spirit to combat material conditions, you're an old theology, whether you have a god and devil, or whether you have the good and evil of philosophy, or whether you have the immortal mind and the mortal mind of metaphysics. You're still in humanhood. It is only when you come to a specific place in consciousness where the issue is sharply drawn, where you actually see that what you're dealing with in your consciousness is merely is mind or matter power or a spirit the only power. And then you rest. Because now that if you come to that place, then there's no longer any question in your mind. And you know that spirit is the only power, but you haven't yet grasped it to the point of facing the issue with every claim. One person comes with a physical claim, one with a mental claim, one with a moral claim, one with a financial claim. 
And uh, when you reach this point that this class is at this week, and more especially I'm speaking of those members of the class that have been with us long enough to know, then the issue is clearly defined within you. You are no longer in doubt about what is truth. Such a question now must be nonsensical to you. I know what truth is. It is that there is no material force or power, and there is no mental force or power that is really power. There are only powers as long as we can be made to accept them. Spirit is the only power. Now, <clears throat> I've brought this up many times. You see the proof of this in the fact that all of these black magic outfits the hexes of Pennsylvania, or the black dot of the, the evil kahunas of Hawaii, or the aborigines of Australia, none of them can operate unless they can make their people believe in the power of witchcraft. Otherwise, witchcraft just doesn't operate. Now then, it is in the same way that laws of matter and laws of mind mental laws, can operate in the consciousness of those who can be made to believe them. If you can drill into the public mind hard enough, the stupidities of psychology and psychiatry, you can have them accepted, and then they become the laws unto the people. Anything that you can convince somebody of, even that there's a ghost in the cemetery, or that they can get healed by going to some bones that are in a graveyard. If you can just make them believe it hard enough, you can have an effect in the human world. Now, we, at this stage of our spiritual unfoldment, have come to where the issue is clearly drawn. What am I to do when somebody comes to me with a physical claim, a mental claim, a moral claim, a financial claim? Outwardly, I say, I'm with you. Inwardly, I smile. Is there more than one power? Do you see that? Is there a, a material force one? No. No, I am the only power. Spirit, which is the I of my being. But it's the I of your being. That's why I can go away and not have to sit home waiting for you to telephone me. Because it isn't only the I of Joel that's God. It's the I of you, wherever you are. So when I say, I will be with you, I am with you every time you say or think I. And therefore, I just don't have to sit in one city waiting for the mail to come in or the telephone calls to come in. For wherever I am, you are. Wherever you are, I am. For there's only one I. And so I'm not bound down then waiting for the call of human beings to tell me they're sick. They'll reach me wherever I am. But so will my realization of spirit alone reach them wherever they are, for there's only one consciousness, and I am that consciousness. Now, just see how simple this makes spiritual living and spiritual healing. It is true that occasionally you have to use contemplative meditation, that is, you have to sit down and if you like to call it that, reason things out with yourself. Go over some Bible passage or some uh, principle of the infinite way, ponder it, until you come up to the point of conviction. Because after all, the only power is after you've reached the point of conviction, not when you're just declaring this with your mind. So that we do have to sometimes lift ourselves by our bootstraps. We do sometimes come down and believe appearances. 
I was caught not last week. A uh, letter came in from uh, a student having marital difficulties. And uh, with quite a story about his wife's conduct. And of course, I was very spiritual and very absolute. And I realized quickly that none of that was had anything to do with uh, the subject at all, that we were dealing with a spiritual universe and so forth. But the next day I had a letter from her. Of course, her story was entirely different. I got caught. Because for a moment I thought to myself, uh-oh, it isn't that way at all. But you see, I wasn't quick enough to say it isn't either way at all. And so for a well, I, I will say for six hours I was caught until all of a sudden it banged into me. What is this? One of these people right and the other one is wrong? <coughs> you have to do that too. You get caught sometimes. Your human sympathy with a child, perhaps, will make you say, poor dear. But, and it is for that reason that we have the letter of truth. It is for that reason that we have so many books. We can pick up one here and there and catch something and then go back to ponder it. We can listen to a tape. All of a sudden something will come through and we'll ponder it. We may even think we were just led to that tape. As a matter of fact, you'd have found the same thing on every one of the tapes. Because I don't believe there are any of the tapes that haven't got the whole message on them. Now... <clears throat> It's true that every tape has some particular thing that may not be in that way on other tapes. But so far as our use is concerned, we'll always find a truth on any one of the tapes or in any one of the books upon which we can hinge our contemplative meditation. But what I want you to see this morning is this. You have no further excuse ever to say what is truth. Or do I understand truth? Or do I know truth? Because that's all nonsense. You may question sometimes the degree of your realization. But no longer can you doubt what is truth. You know what truth is. The truth is that we're dealing with a world belief of mental and physical powers. And as against that, the understanding that's true. Spirit alone is power, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. The battle is not yours. Stand ye still. And see the salvation of the Lord. See, really, that spirit alone is the only power. Now, as you go into your meditation, or treatment, or prayer, whatever you call it, for yourself or your patient. That's what you have to do. You, you have to state the truth to yourself. Now, wait a minute. Do I understand my basis? This is a physical claim, mental, moral, financial. But all of the saying is that there is a power other than spirit. Can I believe there is a power other than spirit? Can I believe there is a power other than... God, can I believe that man whose breath is in his nostril is a power? Can I believe that even legal law is a power? Can I believe that a government is a power? No, I can't believe anything like that. I can only believe that spirit is power. Then when you settle down into your inner peace, then that feeling comes over you. I am with you. It may not say it in those words, but there'll be that feeling. I am with you. I am on the scene. There's no power but me. But this is my beloved child. Something will come giving you the assurance. Only do not ever, do not ever again wonder what is truth. Or do I know what truth is? Do not ever again question yourself about that. You know, you're going out and telling the world we've discovered the whole truth. 
They wouldn't believe it. A letter the other day from someone says, of course, no teaching has the whole truth. How ridiculous can a statement be? Actually, every teaching has the whole truth if you can dig it out and find it. But in this one, we're emphasizing the whole truth. And uh, I believe Jesus when he said that you have to become as a little child to be able to accept it because there's nothing complicated about it. Here's your issue. Are there physical, mental powers? Or am I alone power? Is the kingdom of God within me? Is the entire power of this universe embodied within me? Has God given me dominion over all it is? That's the, that then is the issue, and that's the full and complete truth. Everything else are just the stepping stones leading up to that final revelation. On this side of the battlefield, we have the belief that man whose breath is in his nostril is a power. Bombs are powers. Medicines are powers. Germs are powers. Physical, mental, moral powers over here. And on this side, we have a smile. Bankers have no power. That's what given thee of God. All power is given un unto me, the hymn says. All power is given unto me. By virtue of God's grace, I have dominion over all. I have dominion. The eye of my being, which is the eye of your being, has dominion over everything. You see, the only reason some of these uh, religious teachings have gone astray is that they have embodied the I, either in Buddha or Jesus or somebody else, saints, seers, instead of embodying the power in I, which is the I of me and the I of you. It was the I of them and it will be the I of all that come to the future in proportion to our recognition of it. Now, you can never again question the efficacy of this message. Because all you have to do to demonstrate and prove it is to set yourself on one side with spirit as the only power maintaining and sustaining its own identity and withdrawing from the battle and letting error destroy itself. Let the arm of flesh destroy itself. Sit by and be a beholder. Question. I can understand that supply must always flow out from you. It can never flow to you. It seems so clear how to open out ways for the imprisoned splendor to pour forth when dealing with supply. Will you please explain what you said last night, that health must flow out from you? I do not understand how one can open out ways for health to flow from you. If a person is bedridden with, for example, arthritis, how can he open out ways for health for, to flow from her? Well, I'm glad you asked that question for the simple reason that that is, again, bringing to a sharp issue something that I have been saying now. Well, it came to a head. I've been saying it a long time, but it came to a head in Toledo. Tell me if I'm wrong. When the subject of the lecture was self-purification. Now, if you think that a bedridden woman with arthritis is ever going to be healed from outside means, you're absolutely wrong. There's nothing from without her that entered to defile or make a lie. It was what proceeded out of her mouth that did it. Now, I'm not going back to the old type of mental treatment of looking within them for their personal errors. Because what proceeded out of her mouth was a universal belief of which she was ignorant and permitted it. And so I'll illustrate to you. If you yourself completely purge yourself every day so that you have, and at our stage, remember, we must do this. 
we must spend at least an hour a day with ourselves. Because if we don't, we have nothing to offer the public. You see, one of the faults of our students, of all students, is that as soon as they hear a little truth, they want to get out on a platform with it. They want to save the world. Everybody else is going to be saved. They haven't been saved. But they're going to save the world. They're going to give this away right away. Now, of course, they've got nothing to give. Words in a book the other people could have found for themselves. Don't think for a minute that I have anything to offer you except the hours that I spend in my inner meditation so that when I come here, I come not with words but with conviction, with demonstrated consciousness. And those of you who've been around me have seen how many hours I give to that. That's why I don't go out for meals when we're in uh, classwork. That's why even in our home, we never have a guest in our home. Never, never. And we are never guests of anybody. Uh, there are only two couples in all of Hawaii that are received in our homes as guests. They're both couples of students. One of them comes in once a year. And the other couple may come in uh, two or three times in a month for a breakfast on Sunday or a Saturday night supper or something. But they're students. And that's our entire social activity in Hawaii. And we never visit anybody but those same two couples. And one of those couples we visit once a year. And one of those couples we visit maybe once a month. And you can be assured that the conversation is at all times strictly infinite way. And that is why we can be in our home and be in this consciousness morning, noon, and night. Now, there are a few local students there that drop in sometimes every day. We have a meditation or we have a lesson. Sometimes two or three or four come in at one time and we'll have a meditation or we'll have a lesson. There are always people coming over from the mainland, probably every week there's one or two, and uh, they will come in for a half hour, three quarters of an hour sometimes, and have a lesson with me or a meditation and leave, even though they've come all the way from the United States. We don't entertain them and don't permit them to entertain us. Because if I'm out in the world, I'm not inside in the spirit, and I have nothing to give you. So with you. You have nothing to offer your world, your practice, your students. If you think for a minute they're interested in your bodies, you're soon going to wake up and find out that they aren't. And if they were, it would be so very temporary that you'd be very sad about it. Nor are they interested in your mind or what education you had, nor are they interested in the furnishings of your home. Those are all momentary things. They are interested in your developed spiritual capacity. And that's all. How did you get a developed spiritual capacity? Well, since we're Christians, rather have taken the Christian master as our way shower, we have developed our spiritual consciousness by following his teaching. Now what is his teaching? That we pray for our enemies. That we learn how to forgive 70 times 7 and maybe start all over again then 70 times 7 again. That we take no thought for our own lives. that we serve God by serving man. Whether we visit him in prison, whether we heal him, whether we feed him, whether we comfort him, whether we do it materially or whether we do it spiritually, we have to do a little of each. By praying in secret, by doing our arms in secret. In other words, by negating the self. Every time we pray in public, we're glorifying the self. Every time we give alms in public, we're glorifying ourselves. Every 
free time we sit around just knowing the truth about our friends. We're just glorifying ourselves. It is in those silent hours when we're praying that the mind of the enemy be open to God. That actually we realize there is no enemy because the mind of man is in power. It's only the mind of God. That's praying for him when we know that the mind of man is in power. It's the mind of God. That is man whose breath is in his nostril mind. Now, when you follow out those programs, when you sit in the silence and you say to yourself, I have naught against any man. I realize God to be the life of individual being. I realize God to be the soul, the presence, the spirit of individual man, woman, child, every color, race, creed. For there is no such thing. Let's see this for a minute. Ask yourself this question now. Is there a God? Well, where is God located? In the white race, the black race, the yellow race? And that makes it ridiculous. Is God on the American continent? African continent, any other continent, that's ridiculous. If there is a God at all, all you can say is God is, but that must be just as true when you're on the Zambezi as when you're on the Hudson. If that's true, you understand what the master meant when he said, call no man on earth your father. There's only one creative principle. Now, what's the use of fooling ourselves, and when you know that inwardly, you're purging yourself of hate, envy, jealousy, malice, bigotry, bias, and uh, you are purifying yourself. Now you can say, I have naught against any man. Now you can say, I have made peace with my brother. I can look all over this globe and I can't find a single person I'm in disagreement with. I can feel that my conscious union with God constitutes my oneness with all spiritual being and idea. And now I can pray and my prayers will break through to the very center of my being because there's nothing interfering with them. Now, as I live in that consciousness, I wonder if you think that rheumatism or arthritis can uh, take hold of that consciousness. Is there any rheumatism going out of my consciousness? No, there's life, truth, and love. Now, nobody got rheumatism or arthritis outside their own being. They got it from accepting the world's uh, way of life. One person got rheumatism, another one got cancer, another one got consumption, another one got polio. How? Accepting the world's estimate and uh, having a specialized God over here and have, having certain brothers and sisters over here and entertaining their world animosities, their world beliefs or individual or collective uh, by having a selfhood apart from God, having a God apart from God, having love apart from God. Now, it isn't this lady's fault that she has rheumatism. But if she's ever brought to truth and continues with it, it's her fault, because she can get rid of it. All she has to do is sit down every... To begin with, you can get rid of it for her. If uh, you are living this life, you have such a clear transparency that with a little patience, no matter how severe the case is, it'll be healed. But uh, that won't constitute any favor to her. Because next year she'll come up with a cancer. The year after she'll come up with old age. The year after with something else. Because she's going back to her sins. I forgive you, but sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Don't go back to the same state of material consciousness. Now, the material state of consciousness brought on the disease. 
the belief in infection, the belief in contagion, the belief in uh, weather, the belief in climate. That's the material state of country. That brought it on. So even if you get rid of it for her, that won't prevent it bringing on something else tomorrow or next year. So if she wants to be healed and remain free of disease, that's when she has to open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. And she has to sit down every single day and start to pray in secret, start to do some alms in secret, start to forgive her enemies, start to pray for those who despitefully use her, start to forgive the Germans and the Japanese and the Hindus and the so forth and so on. Uh, she has to purge herself of her prejudices against a mother-in-law or father-in-law or daughter-in-law. She has to come to a place where she is no longer hating, fearing, or loving error. She has to come to that place when she is in conformity to the principles taught by Jesus Christ. She has to learn to forgive 70 times 7. She has to come eventually to a place where she can say, I wouldn't care if you struck me dead. I couldn't get mad at you. I'd still say, Father, forgive you. Lady. You know not what you do. She will have to bring herself to the place where all the people who talk scandal about her, that she can just look at them and smile and say, neither do I condemn me. I forgive you. And I'm going to pray, God, forgive you double. You see, that's purging oneself. And your prayers never reach the center of your being until you're purged. That's the whole meaning of the New Testament. There is neither Greek nor Jew, neither bond nor free. There is only one, and we are one in Christ Jesus. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. Any form, ceremony, doctrine of the outer plane is nothing. It is the circumcision of the heart, that is, the purging, the purifying, the cleansing, the cutting out of everything unnecessary and unclean of oneself. Not that you and I are evil, not that she's evil, but every single one of us is evil in the sense that we have accepted two powers. If she doesn't get purged of that, how is she going to get purged of uh, disease? You, through your consciousness, may free her as Jesus freed everybody. And then say, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. In other words, there's only one reason. This whole morning's lesson is that. There's only one reason why we're sick. Material sense. We believe in material and mental powers. Infection, contagion. This, that, and the other thing. Weather, climate. Now, if material sense makes us ill, the antidote for it is spiritual consciousness or the realization that spirit alone is power. If I say that spirit alone is power and I don't love God and man, I'm a liar. So I'm full of rheumatism or cancer or consumption or something else. So I have to open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. I have to open out a way for forgiveness to flow out from me, prayers to flow out from me for the good and the bad. Why should I pray only for the moral people on earth? It's the other ones who need it most. Why should I only pray for my supply or your supply? It's the poor people who don't know how to pray who need our prayers most. Therefore, if I understand the message of Jesus Christ and live by it, if I give my first fruits to God, but remember that I can't withhold them from my fellow man. You can't give to God while withholding from your fellow man. That's a lie. Now I'm opening out a way. Now my whole system is being purged, purified. Disease can't, you know, disease can't come to a body. A body is really a corpse. It's just dead matter. 
The only thing alive is one's consciousness. And that's what governs this body. Take consciousness away from the body and the heart can't function. Now, it isn't the body uh, that gives us life. It is our consciousness that gives life to our body. Now, what have you in the house? What have you in your consciousness? A realization of spirit alone as power or a fear of material powers? Or a fear of mental powers? Or a faith in material powers? And a faith in mental powers? Well, that's what you have to be purged of. You have to draw this issue clearly. So it is. We don't condemn a person because they committed adultery. They didn't really commit it at all. That's nothing but a universal sense, which at that moment they accepted. There's no condemnation in that. That's ignorance. Therefore, what do we do? We forgive ignorance, don't we? But to the individual committing adultery, we have to say, go and sin no more. Do you see that? Because that opens it again to every single same thing that happened before. So it is. If I say, forgive 70 times 7, and I do it. But the 491st one, I don't do it. Well, I've got to go back. I've accepted that state of consciousness. Now, all these people, uh, and this is true especially in England. There is more arthritis in England than in all the rest of the world put together. Right? And uh, I know that because I've been all over the world. And there, I would say there's five times, ten times more in England than any place else. The reason for it is the climate. You have the worst climate on the face of the globe. <laughs> So far as health is concerned, and for those who believe in weather or climate as having to do with health, you really have a nasty climate over there. It doesn't bother me. I like the cold weather and the hot, and I like the wet and the dry. It really doesn't bother me. But I do know from observation that it's pretty bad. And so the result of it is all of these people who have been told by their doctors that climate and weather does this. They're all in bed with arthritis and rheumatism. Well, they've seen past generations go to bed with it, and so naturally that's the pattern in their mind. And of course they can stand the uh, British climate until they're 40. It's really after that that they're not strong enough to take it anymore. I mean, that's all the human belief that's been poured into them. Their grandmothers and fathers had it, their mothers and fathers. Of course, they're not going to escape it either. That's the pattern in their mind. But if you can bring to them the awareness that these mental beliefs are not power and the material weather isn't power, but that I am power, spirit is power, God is the only power, pretty soon you get them to where there's neither good nor evil in effect. God is the only cause. But then their diseases start to leave the body. See that? Now, the disease never was in the body, it was in the mind. Nobody ever gets a disease in the body. You can only get a disease through taking it in the mind. Uh, a doctor came to me in Boston in the early days of my practice told me that he was practicing on the very next block to my office and told me that he had, had two or three of his uh, patients that he couldn't help had come to me and been helped or healed. And he was curious because he'd lived there in that neighborhood a long time, but he never really believed that those people across the street were doing what they say. But here he saw it. Could I explain it to him? Said, of course, I can't explain it to you in a visit. But I can give you enough to uh, carry away with you, uh, at least to give you a point of thought to begin with. And I said, now here we're sitting in our office, and here's the window, and here's the door. This was in winter. So I said, let's open this window, and let's open this door, and what's going to happen to us? Oh, we're going to catch cold. 
I know we're not. You are, but I'm not. I said, that's one thing we prove here. You go across the street there, you'll see there are 4,000 people every week, and you won't find four of them with a cold. But you go right across the street to that other church where there's 2,000, and you'll see 500 of them with a cold. That's the difference. Now, tell me why are you so sure that we'll catch cold? The draft. Yes. Where will we catch cold? Well, it could be the chest, it could be the head, lungs, so on. Then you mean that uh, my lungs know that we've opened the door and the window? Lungs? No, they don't know. My chest knows it, my head knows it, my nose knows it? No. Well, how does my body know that that door and window are open? Oh, I said, yes. You see, my body has to know it. Now, how does my body know? No, your body doesn't know. Your mind knows. I said, well, then you can't catch cold in the body. You have to catch cold in the mind. And I thought you're going to think that one over. Do you see what I'm getting at now? She can't have rheumatism in the body, can she? No. There's no way of the body knowing what the weather is or what the climate is. And more especially, if you dress properly, the body doesn't know the difference. You're, you're st always at the same temperature, so it can't know anything. But the mind does. Do you see that? And the mind is reacting to impressions. And the Im it's malpractice, it's called. And those impressions have been given by seeing father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, aunt and uncle, cousins. And so why not me? See that? So if this lady is to be healed of uh, rheumatism, she's got to open out a way to overcome the belief that there's power in either belief or matter. And she'll have to accept in her consciousness the fact that the spirit alone is power. But that may not be enough because it isn't only that that she's suffering from. There's the universal hates, animosities, antagonisms, which she is building up in her system. Everybody has prejudices, you know, biases, bigotries in the human world. And uh, they're not their own. They're, they're just brought on us. If you happen to be English, you just don't like the Germans or the Japanese or the Hindus. If you're Americans, you probably don't like the Filipinos or the Cubans, and each one has their national prejudices and so forth and so on. We have a man here in Chicago who's still fighting King George, or he was until recently. <laughs> you don't get those things out of your system, do you think? Now, it all boils down to, is there mental power through belief, or is there physical power, or a spirit the only power. And so you'll find that everybody on the earth is suffering from beliefs accepted and entertained, not consciously, but merely by the fact that they're born into the human world. So when you begin to purge them as I purge myself in my daily work, and as you must purge yourself, and as you must teach others to purge themselves. In the beginning, when you're healing, you don't burden them with it. You take up the burden of the work and give them some measure of freedom. But the minute they start to experience freedom, that's when you begin to say, look, you will have to read these books and learn these principles. You will have to hear these tapes and learn these principles. Then you will have to take them into your consciousness after you've learned them and begin to work with them. You will have to sit down every single day and not pray until you have made peace with your brother all over this globe. You will have to learn not to pray unless you are learning to forgive every offense, not only against you, against your nation, your church, against the peace of the world, against the integrity of the world, and so forth and so on. And then you will find that if 
I come to my platform, my desk here, and I'm not looking out at you as a male or female. I'm not seeing you that way. And I'm not seeing you as rich or poor or having titles or no titles. I'm not seeing you for your clothing. I'm not even seeing you for your education. It doesn't make any difference to me. If I sit here and see you as I have been trained to see, as that God constitutes your being, God is the life of you. Now I sit here with no judgment, no criticism, no condemnation, no praise, no flattery. See that? You don't know what it is, but I know what you're feeling out there. I know it. And I know when classes in the beginning didn't feel that way the first, second, or third night, they did by the fourth night, when we had more mixed groups than we have now in our classes. That first night bristled in the classroom. The second night started to, uh, well, just calm down to suspicion. See, the first night they were waiting for me to uh, either condemn Mrs. Eddy or the board of directors, or somebody else was out there waiting for me to say something about unity or new thought. And they were all sitting on the defensive, because I was just smiling inside. By the second night, they commenced to feel, well, he isn't doing any of those things, right? Well, how can you tell? Wait, I'll be, I'm not going to judge yet, wait. But by Thursday night, that's why in those days we had to have ten nights for class. The first four nights were just spent trying to get ourselves together to be of one mind and love one another. Right? And then after that, the teaching began, and we had six good nights. See that? Now we don't have that because most of our classes are made up of people who have read the books, they already know there's no antagonisms in there or judgment. And many of the students who have been through class, and they know by now that I have pets. But my pets aren't just the wealthy people or the prominent people or the titled people. The pets are always those who are devoting their life to this message. See that? And uh, in one way or another, they feel it. They know that they're pets. They know that I'll share anything, give anything... There's no limit. It isn't always uh, evidenced by giving time. I remember one time when Lorraine felt left out in the cold. She made the trip all the way from Chicago to New York to see me and didn't even get an appointment. But she was my pet. I showed her that way. <laughs> now, you see, if I sit here really and truly, with no condemnation and no praise and no flattery. If I have no idea of you as either good or evil, I don't make it my business whether you're robbing banks at this moment or committing adultery at this moment. That doesn't bother me because I'm not sitting in judgment on your humanhood. I don't care whether you're sick or well, rich or poor, high or low. I am sitting here completely in one way. God constitutes individual beings. And my conscious union with God constitutes my oneness with your spiritual being, all spiritual being. And that's the only part of you I want contact with. Now, you don't know this, but you are not feeling any condemnation or criticism from me. See that? And you're not getting any flattery. So therefore, you're sitting there at peace. If I was sitting here flattering or condemning, you'd feel it. See that? I said it. As you go into your practice, as you go into your student body, you have to develop that same state of consciousness in which you don't care whether your students are right or wrong. You're not judging them. You're not taking part of whether they're sick or well. If they're sick, sometimes you can even see the things that are making them sick. But you're not going to tell them about it because you'd be judging, criticizing, and wouldn't be helping because they can't help it. They can't change. The only thing can change is you can change them by holding them in spiritual realization of their true identity. See that? Oh, that doesn't mean that after they get to be serious students, 
that you don't hear in there correct their line of either thought or their line of conduct, uh, because you're doing that out of the greater experience that you've had before, and you're going to just save them a few steps. They would eventually find it out for themselves anyhow. I did. They would too. But I don't really believe it's necessary for every generation to make the mistakes of the generation before. They do, but they really don't have to. Uh, it shouldn't be necessary. The... Uh, the uh, lessons of one generation should be able to go down to the others. In the human picture, they very seldom do. But in the spiritual picture, they can if the student is sufficiently unself to take it. That's the point. Uh, I don't dominate students, and I don't control them. But I'm certainly going to give them the benefit of everything I've got, whether they can accept it and use it, that's up to them. I'm going to give it. Now, here is your patient then. And in this case it may be arthritis, and in the next case it may be polio, and in the next case it may be uh, cancer. And actually, you're not holding him in bondage to that disease because you yourself are continuously working from the standpoint of, yes, this is just another claim of material power or mental power, belief. And, of course, I'm not accepting that. And, therefore, you are each day bringing better sense of health to that patient until eventually they'll be completely healed. But while you are doing this, you're also going to enlighten them so that they will know how to go and sin no more. Yeah? Now, they don't know now. The woman taking adultery did. She knew he meant just don't commit adultery anymore. But when you say to your student, who sin wasn't adultery, go and sin, well, they don't know what you're talking about. They say, I don't rob banks, I don't steal, I don't defraud. Ah, uh, that isn't what you meant. You meant, now begin to pray in secret, give alms in secret, pray every single day for your enemies, Search your entire mind from A to Z to be sure that you have forgiven any and every offense of the past, present, or future. Be sure that you never hold any person in condemnation the sins of the past, present, or future. Purge yourself, purge yourself, purge yourself, and you teach them how to do it, step by step with every one of these principles. Do you see that? You even remove fear from them. The secret of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want it. He leadeth me beside still waters. And you bring them back into that atmosphere in which they do rest in the Lord. Do you see that? Now, our major sin is that we put power in effects. We put power in money as supply. We put power in germs and infection as a cause of disease. We put power in weather and climate as a cause of disease. We put power in uh, so much. Even in our art treasures, we put power in them as if they themselves were had the value or the, or the beauty. Whereas we are learning in this work that everything that exists as a fact is wonderful for use, for joy, for pleasure, for practicality, but not for putting our faith in them. Our faith is in the invisible, always in the invisible. Money is in supply. The consciousness of God's presence within me is supply. Money is a symbol of supply that will appear outwardly in proportion to my understanding of the nature of supply as spirit. Therefore, with all I get in, get spirit, not money. See that? In the same way, our faith, our belief, our antagonism is to germs and infection. Therefore, Come to the realization 
The Germans are in power. Weather is in power. Climate is in power. I, I am power. The Spirit of God in me is the power with complete dominion over weather, over climate, over storms, over hurricanes, over tidal waves. The Spirit of God in me is the power unto them. Do you see that? Now, as this woman with arthritis commences to learn these lessons, you don't think that arthritis can stay there. In order for it to stay there, she'd have to prove the two objects can occupy the same place at the same time. By every automobile crack-up is proof that that can't happen. Just can't happen. You can't have two places occupying the same place at the same time. And uh, so we purge ourselves of sin-filled thought. Only our sense of sin isn't quite the same as the orthodox sense. Because I don't think we have too much of sin-filled thought in that direction. But we have lots of sin-filled thought in the degree of our faith or confidence in two powers. And sometimes believing that material power is even uh, sometimes stronger than spiritual. Now, as I see this, it all hinges on a point that we've been making every single night this week in class. It isn't a matter that spirit has greater power than mind or matter. It's that mind and matter isn't power. That's really been the essence of this whole week's class. That's page 13 of the book B Letters. How far have we come out of orthodoxy? Well, we believed in God and evil, the devil, good and evil. How far have we come out of metaphysics when we believe that divine mind overcame mortal mind? Into the infinite way, which is a revelation that everything that's embraced in what we call carnal mind or mortal mind is not power. And therefore, we don't have even the power of God on our side. We don't have any side because there isn't any other side. Do you see that? Well, I'm going to say to you, and I hope you will say to those who come to you, That while I would not like to hear that anybody turned these tapes on at night and had them going while they were asleep, I do hope that the tapes of this Chicago class, and for you the tapes of this, will be kept pretty busy until these principles are clearly stated within you. If I've learned anything at all in my work, it is this, that a teacher can only play a small part in the student's unfoldment. And that is, first of all, lifting them to where they can apprehend a principle and then giving them the principle to apprehend. But that is about the limit. It's what the student does with those principles after they've gotten them that makes the difference in their demonstration. And so it is. You have seen this week in that Chicago class, you've seen in this, uh, two ta in this one tape here, that there are enough in the way of spiritual principles so that you can really say the whole truth is summed up in them. Don't let anybody tell you that we haven't got the whole truth in this teaching. We have all the truth that's ever been revealed in any of the literature there is in the world and some of it that hasn't yet been written. We have it, but I don't believe that it's going to save the world. I believe it's going to save me because I know it is because I'm living with it as faithfully as God gives me the grace to do it. And I know that it will do the same thing for those who will give it as much as I am giving it. It won't do for you any more than you will do for it. You are the one who determines to what extent you will embody these principles and practice them. And uh, even in this morning, so much has been said that hearing it ten times isn't going to give you all these principles. So, it may even be necessary to play these for ten minutes. K 
catch a principal and go away and say, that's enough, that's enough. I'll work with that principal for two, three, four days. Play it a little more till you hit another one and say, uh uh, that's enough. I'll live with that principal. Because we're not dealing with 60 or 70 minutes of tape here. We're dealing with uh, six, eight, or ten principles that are on that tape. It doesn't make any difference if you don't hear the end of the tape for two years. If you have been doing enough with each of the principles that you come up to, it's the same with the books. The most ridiculous thing in the world are these people who read the Bible all the way through from cover to cover once a year. There's no value in that. The person who takes the Bible and really works with a scriptural passage, a principle, in the course of a year, they may only have four or five principles, but their lives will outshine anyone who's reading morning, noon, and night in it without seeing that we're dealing with principles. And our major principle is, here it is, over here is mental and physical power. Is it, or is it the arm of flesh, nothingness? That's the end of our principle. Well, now this concludes our special work, but with this just added reminder, these are the principles you are to think of when doing your work for the world. These are the principles you are to remember when you sit down and take up this matter of subliminal perception in the world or uh, communism or uh, whatever it is that appears to our world as the operation of the carnal mind. These are the things. Now, you'll be handling uh, uh, epidemic one day the season comes when there are colds, grip, flu. The season comes for polio. The season comes for hay fever. You are working with these principles on those specific subjects. There are other days when you have no specific subjects in mind. There are other days when uh, forcibly brought to your attention is the subject of totalitarianism or government by man whose breath is in his nostril. There are other days when... Uh, It'll be another night.